Welcome and thank you for joining us for this evening's event with Peter Morton Cohen, author of Ellis Island Interviews in Their Own Words. Tonight's program is brought to you by Save Ellis Island, the nonprofit partner of the National Park Service for the restoration and reuse of the historic buildings on Ellis Island's South Side. My name is Lori Conway. I'm the author of the Forgotten Ellis film and book. Tonight, I have the pleasure of speaking with Peter Morton Cohn. If you have questions for Peter, the author of this wonderful, beautiful book, please type them in the chat. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. you. Coming from South Carolina. Is that where you are right now, Peter? That's where I am. Okay, and I'm in Boston. Uh, so, Peter, the book is so wonderful. I remember reading it years ago when I was producing uh, Forgotten Ellis Island, and mm -hmm. the voices became alive to me. They brought the story of Ellis mm -hmm. into my mm -hmm. heart as as mm -hmm. somebody, a grandchild who of three of four grandparents who came through mm -hmm. Ellis. So, where did the idea of your book come from, and what uh, was the, what was the goal of the book? Well, the, there's a newspaper out on Long Island, uh, Newsday. It's their daily. And um, they ran a squib in the middle of the newspaper, a short article about how Ellis Island was looking for more information about the original immigrants who came through and as part of an oral history project and they were gathering information. And, and I said to myself, has anybody bothered to speak with these immigrants? Has anybody bothered to interview them? So I went out to Ellis Island and I met with those there and, and the answer was no, nobody had what, done What it. year was this, Peter? What year was this? This was 1990, ooh, 1994, 95, something like that. I know the book was published in 97 and then you 97. had a revision of the book in 2004. Right. So you read about this in the mid nineties and two years later, what did you achieve? Well, then I got a list of the best stories. So in other words, I went to uh, Barry Moreno, who was the chief librarian, and he, he said to me, these are the best stories. And I was looking for stories that were representative of the culture. So whatever the culture was, whether it was Irish or German or Italian, that the stories not be duplicated, but they be representative of that culture. And so he told me, he gave me the contact information on all, all, all of those people. And then I went after them, you know. So how many did you interview and how many are still alive today? 741 were interviewed. By you? 141 made the book. Oh. None are alive today. Oh, so you truly did capture their stories before they were lost. Yes, truly. I mean, the last one was Isabel Bolarski. She's on page 267. She was one of my she was one of my favorites. And um, she died at 101. Oh. And uh, last year, last April, actually. So she's been dead a year. And um, she was the last surviving original immigrant from the book. So what did you discover, uh, Peter, through these voices and their stories? And we have one of those voices, one of your favorites, Manny Steen. Yes. Who was 19 years old in 1925 when he emigrated right. through Ireland, uh, from Ireland. Uh, yeah. Maybe we could hear just a short clip of his audio interview with you, if you could play that, Karen. Sure. Let's see where that is. We're not hearing it yet. Okay, there we go. His name was Emmanuel Steen. Yes, and they called him Manny. Manny. I don't hear that wonderful Irish accent yet though. <laughs> Could we bring that video audio up? Bear with us here. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, Manny was one of your favorites, wasn't he? Because of that. Yeah, I mean, Manny Steen is the classic. If I had to choose one story yeah. from my book, it would be Manny's story about coming to his America. His brother was already here. He left Ireland when he, he was 19. Now we've got him. Okay. Oh, thank great. You. Let's hear him. All right, so we're having a little trouble hearing this. So, but the the clip that we were looking for talked about him paying two dollars for a suitcase, a cardboard suitcase, and yet he had nothing to put in it, right, Man, um, uh, um, Peter? And that yes. indicated that Manny had so little belongings when he came through, right? Here he yeah, bought a yeah. cardboard suitcase, yeah. but he he had his stamp collection to put in Thank it. You, right. So how did that how did that kind of represent the immigrants coming through Ellis and really having nothing as well, they came? The reason his story is a classic story is because he came here, his brother was already here. He didn't have two nickels to rub rub together. He didn't even have money to get on the subway. His brother had to loan him the money. And this his story, and he goes through everything you can think of. And at the end of his story, he buys a hot dog on the mainland overlooking the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island. And he takes a seat on the park bench. And the only thing he's thinking is, I'm free. I made it to America. I'm here. With hot dog in hand, what could be more American, right? Right. right. <laughs> it's just the classic story, you know. And, and, uh, and his line that I'll always take from his interview is, he, he said to me, I said, how did you do that? You went through hell. You went through, he said, Peter, when you're 19 years old, you can you can do a lot. You can go through a lot. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. So I thought the organization of your book, um, yeah. you know, uh, this is called the Ellis Island Interviews in their own words for those who sure. would like to purchase the book. It's on Amazon. It's just a, a beautiful read. Um, so you, you organized it according to ethnic groups. Why yeah. did you? do that and what did the different groups have in common or set what set them apart if anything uh as um, you were doing all of these different interviews 700 and some interviews yeah um the all of the ethnic groups got their own chapter except for italy they got two they uh for northern italian and southern italian there were just it was one of the largest groups, them and the Germans and the Irish. Those three groups were were the biggest ones. And um, and so it, it, I did it based on um, um, immigration flows and the number of people who came through from each nationality. Um, that's how I organized the chapters, basically. Um, and also the INS, Immigration Naturalization Service, their focus, the purpose of Ellis Island was not to accept people. The purpose of Ellis Island was to filter and um, eliminate undesirables, not have undesirables come to the United States. And so they had, um, they wanted the genes, of, right. they wanted Northern European genes in this country. 
Yes. And that's what they received. So Germany, Italy, Ireland, these were the these were the three main countries, and Scandinavia too. The, so the countries the preferred though were the white, blue-eyed, right? Yes. From from the Scandinavian countries. Right. right Yet right. the Italians prevailed. That, that was the largest ethnic group to come through, correct? Oh, big time, big time. Yeah. 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 And and so did you find there were differences or what did you find was the underlying similarity that all these different ethnic groups had in their goal to reach America? Um, they all had, what, what I found is that they all had this Darwinian sense of survival, survival of the fittest. It didn't matter what their background was. It didn't matter what their genealogy was. These people wanted freedom. They wanted a home. They wanted a new beginning. They wanted a new life. And um, and uh, the beauty of them is that despite their pain and despite their struggle, they play by the book. I mean, they more, I mean, when you look at what's going on on a southern border now with the migrants, I mean, the original Europeans who came to this country, they played by the rules and they were forced to, but they, they played by the rules and, but they had this marvelous sense of survival. Um, and that's what stands out more than anything. Well, like the border immigrants today, they also were fleeing discrimination and murder, mass murder right. and right. poverty and anti-Semitism. Um, you know, the, it may be a different form, but they did have the same things, you know, right. plaguing, them, plaguing them, which is why they left their home. Right. Uh, right. And, and that is truly one thing that all immigrants, whether it was a hundred years ago or today, Right. They, they, as as uh, one woman said to me, they didn't leave where they came from because life was so good for them. Right. Whatever they had here in America was better. Right. But another group that you focus in on on your wonderful book in your wonderful book are employees who worked on Ellis Island. Oh, That's yeah. an interesting addition. What did their different perspectives contribute to the overall narrative of your book? Was there a three a theme that ran through the employees of Ellis Island experience? Yeah. yeah. I mean they were they were on the receiving end of this vast mass of humanity. And all different types of people, all different types of cultures, and um, they had to be very tight as a unit to to survive. Um, I remember one of the INS uh, officers saying to me, "Well, I said to him, well, so what are some of the nationalities that you were looking out for?" And he said, "Well, we're looking out for all of them, but basically uh, the Chinese." He said, "You got to be careful with them." I said, "Why?" He said, they're, they're good people, they work hard, they're family oriented, but they tend to gamble and they tend to take chances and they drink too much. And they, you know, so we kept an eye on them. Um, it sounds like so, something they said about the Irish though as well. My yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, so, so they had their pockets, they had their, you know, each one was looking out for, but you know, it, it wasn't easy for them. I mean, they had to, they had to, um, to, to be even-handed despite all of the differences uh, in the people that were coming in yeah and and the employees some of them lived on the island or not some of them lived on the island some didn't uh, most didn't the ones who did were people like dr baker um yes. and his son bill and we have uh, bill we have bill in our in um in the oh, that's right yeah us. Oh, wonderful. Uh, Bill, we would love to hear from you. Uh, this is Bill, Dr. Baker. Um, I'll let you you introduce his son. Yeah. Peter, you t you tell us who Dr. Baker was and who yeah. Bill is. We have a photo yeah. of him as well. Yeah, yeah Dr. Baker, um, I interviewed Dr. Baker in uh, Florida. I think Bill was there. He, he, was, he was in the condo there. Uh, he had a condo on, on, on the golf course and a, a lovely man. I mean, he a very nice gentleman, and he ran uh, the 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 um, psychiatric unit and uh, hospital unit at uh, 
uh, Ellis Island. Remember, Ellis Island is the letter E. So the top of it is the, 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 the main uh, registry room, the, the main building. And then the middle is the hospital section where the, they did everything from laundry to the cafeteria. And then the bottom E is the psychiatric ward. So Dr. Baker lived in a house at the bottom of letter E and uh, quite a guy. I mean, he, he was quite a personality. <laughs> he had a thing where um, he, he, he'd like to fly. Yeah, go he ahead. liked to fly. He liked to fly his plane under the. He would fly it up the Hudson River. He would go under the George Washington Bridge, turn around, and he would go back again. And he, he used to tell me he used to enjoy doing that. Yeah. So, Bill Baker, uh, Doctor Baker's son, are you yes. with us? Can you can we hear from you about your memories of, of your dad working on Ellis? I, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, and we see you there. So, oh, Bill, okay. tell I... us a little bit about tell us a little bit about your rem your memories of as a child of a of a doctor working on Ellis. What what do you remember? Well, I was only about five six years old when we were st stationed there, and I can remember the first night coming in about ten o'clock, or I would guess dark through the harbor and I, it seemed like kind of a spooky thing to me. It, I could just see the lights of the island as we approached it. Uh, it was very interesting for a kid to live in an environment like that on an island, very isolated. Um, and how, I, how old were you, Bill? And did you go to school there? I, I was, okay arrived when I was five and left when I was six. And I went to kindergarten and first grade, but no school on the island. I had to trek over to Governor's Island, had to take the ferry into Manhattan and uh, catch the other ferry to Governor's Island, which was an army base, walk across the island to school every day, well, and escorted by one of my dad's mental patients. Now, I was going to ask you about the patients. Your dad was this, uh, in the psychopathic hospital, uh, okay. a, psychi a psychiatrist, and the, okay. the, the, that medicine was very limited 125 years ago. Right. It was in the very early stages of psychiatry. Do you remember any stories he might have told you in later years when you were older about what kind of, you know, what they could treat or couldn't treat uh, mentally? For their patients? Well, you know, I learned more from reading Peter's interview with my dad than I knew. You know, these weren't the kind of things as a kid you talked about, but I found it fascinating to read what he wrote in response to his discussion with Peter. Yeah, so, Peter tell us in on what Dr. Baker told you about some of the really the experimental kind of treatments they were using on Ellis because they didn't have well, antipsychotic drugs at the time. You know, they, they were limited in what they had uh, yeah. for treatments of uh, mental conditions. Uh, they used electronic shock therapy was still in the early stages and it was somewhat controversial then. Some people viewed it as a punitive yeah. Uh, kind of treatment, and but it got results, and I think over the years it would kind of went out of use, and now is recognized as very effective use if used properly for uh, depression and uh, some other medical conditions. I'm not qualified really to even talk about. What do you remember, Doctor Baker, telling you, Peter? Um. Well, at that time, the, the, the main the main psychoactive drug, there were no psychoactive drugs per se. There was Dilantin for epilepsy, Thorazine for schizophrenia. Um, yeah. But he, he was on the forefront of science. I mean, and he was experimenting to try to 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 advance. And um, and um, so he he had his ECT machine, his electro. Uh, the shock, shock therapy machine, and it, um, and um, he would hook it up to his TV to, to to get juice on it, and it was all in the beginning stages of of um, experimentation, 
um, and uh, the forefront of science. And um, so when I went to Orlando and I, I went to visit him, um, I asked him very pointedly, you know, when you were experimenting with the amperages on the ECT machine, did you did you ever make any mistakes? You know, it's like, and he admitted, yeah, sometimes we were too high, too low. They, they were trying to figure out how it worked. Um, I asked him, have there had there been any escapees from the psychiatric ward? He said three, um, who died in the Hudson River, um, and um, and. He he was very gracious. He was yeah. very kind. It was and, a uh, yard hospital doing the best it could with the limitations, right? With the limitations that he had, and, you know. Medicine, yeah. Now, yeah. Bill, um, I know there's a photo of you. You spent a Christmas on Ellis Island uh, with your parents. You had you received a cowboy outfit that Christmas. <laughs> Remember, I hop, along, hop along Cassidy. If anybody is old enough to remember who got along Cassidy was, he was my TV idol at that age. <laughs> so, oh, it sounds like it was a fun year that you you somewhat remember. Then, uh, there, I think there's a photo of you here. There you are. <laughs> yeah, you can see that Ellis Island behind you. <laughs> No, I, you know, we were there for two years and it was very fascinating. I spent a lot of time There's just your dad. There's your dad. Yeah. You know, watching the ocean liners come by the Statue of Liberty and get saluted by the fire boats. And, you know, when I go into Manhattan uh, on my way to Governor's Island in school every day, I just was fascinated by the seamen docking the ferry. I'm sure. I, that's it. That's an extraordinary childhood memory that it, not many it was different, different, that's for sure. <laughs> Very rare. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate that. Well, back back to you, um, Peter. You know, life on the medical uh, of the medical staff, how did they did they explain a little bit about how the medical staff lived on the island in the dormitories and yeah. You know, you interviewed what were their memories were they mixed or was it a difficult challenging uh um kind of employment or or did they relish it no they they knew that they were in a special situation and they knew that um the immigrants were a captive audience and so they they handled themselves that way um it, it, they were actually, they did a very good job. I have to say the, the employees there did a very good job um, uh, in, in treating the, the immigrants, uh, even those that eventually got deported. Because um, um, remember, the purpose of Ellis Island was as a filter system to, uh, to eliminate undesirables. Yeah. And so if there were physical conditions, medical, legal, um, criminal, any sort of thing, back on the boat, and they w went back to the main country. But they were good. They, they were good about it. Overall, I mean, less than 2% were deported yeah. from Ellis. So that really speaks to an overall percentage being accepted. We have a question. We have a um, remark here. Um, so how many undesirables were returned to their home countries and how? So less than two percent so and yeah. you, you might want to talk a little bit about the special inquiry hearings and how the steamships had to pay the fare back to the country yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so it, it became i mean they were not looking per se to to send people back because they knew of the sacrifice it took to come here they tried to cut all the slack that they could. They weren't tough in that sense. So even though it was a filter system, um, they didn't they didn't go by the book strongly in that way. Um, they had compassion. They had compassion. The benefit of the doubt, right? Yeah, right, 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 right. And and we have another comment. What a lovely collection of narratives, Peter. In your book, I saw that my grandmother came over on the same ship as one of your interviewees from Sicily, the San Giuseppe Verde. 
She mm -hmm. had to endure the hospitalization process of her mother and was seen for three days as an undesirable Sicilian trapped on Ellis Island until cleared. Mm -hmm. I am very proud of this heritage, she writes, resilience and absolute belief in the American dream. Peter, what an impactful contribution you have made to the body of literature that captures the triumph and the hardship of the immigrant experience. Thank you for giving two chapters to my, M-Y, capitalized huh. people, uh -huh. particularly Southern Italians who were considered the lowest rung of immigrants. Right. And then there's one more question that just came in. Was there any relationship between Ellis Island and Castle Garden? I'll let you answer that. Yeah, well, Castle, Go Castle yeah. Garden started first, and um, that was on the mainland. And the reason for Castle Garden was that was sort of like the original Ellis Island. And it, um, um, when the immigrants would get off the boat, they would be attacked virtually by every two-bit hustler uh trying to making promises of jobs and and money and sex and you name it i mean and <clears throat> they were literally being attacked and that was the reason to move off land uh, to the island to ellis island and to try to have the immigration process be there and not on the mainland and so it moved from castle uh uh castle garden to ellis island yeah and, and uh, and and I was going to say, Peter, you, when you were interviewing people, you interviewed over seven hundred people within a two-year yeah. time period. These yeah. were all relatives or survivors themselves, right? right. right? Um, how long were the interviews, and for the most part, where did you, where did you conduct them? Well, in the beginning, I I, I was I, I was very careful, and I went through by the book, and then I said, there's got to be a way to cut to the chase and really get to the best stories. Yeah. And so that's where the 141 came in. And I said, I'm gonna just choose the most, the stories that are most relevant to the genealogy of the immigrant. So it's most representative of, so if it's Irish, if it's Italian, if it's Scandinavian, if it's German. So if you're an immigrant from one of those genealogies, this was representative of your time period of what you went through. So if you're a reader, reading the book, this is what my grandfather or grandmother probably endured or went through. Um, so that's what I was looking for at the end. <laughs> so I was going to, thank you. Um, so what can be learned from these? It sounded like you, you develop, you, you picked up on themes that yeah. each immigrant had, you know, maybe yeah. not according to groups so much, but according yeah. to their personal experience, what can be learned from these experiences, both from then and today, as we look forward, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, to the mass migration that is again, again happening throughout the world, not just to the right, United States. Right, right. The most important, the, the thing I, I think I, I learned was that despite the uh, genealogy of the immigrant, um, these people had an intestinal fortitude. Um, they, I say, are, are a Darwinian survival of the fittest uh, countenance in their in their character. In their, they were strong. They were strong. They might have been poor. They maybe they didn't understand English, but they were determined to be free. They were determined to find a new home. They were determined to find work. Um, and I'll give you an example. I mean, you had people in Europe who were who were very successful there. I like uh, uh, Isabel Bolarski's father, Sidor. He was the head of the Moscow Symphony, and he comes to this country, and you know, he's they were going to give him a, a broom to, to, to clean the streets. You know, he had to start at the bottom of the totem pole yeah. to work his way up, right, and even though he had done all this incredible stuff in Europe, you get to this country and it's a level playing field. And um, and that's why the immigrants had this fortitude because there's no other way to survive. So whether you were successful in Europe or not successful, whether you were old or young, everybody came here and everybody was on the same page, on the same uh, level, uh, basically.
We have another question from the chat box. Um, how did the dynamic change when people started arriving by airplanes? That's a good question. Yeah, well, that was in the 50s, and um, it, it didn't change that much. It didn't change that much. The The airplane did not really add to the um, immigration uh, as much as the boat did. And uh, so that wasn't a factor. Now, of course, all of that is a factor, um, but uh, not at that time. Yeah. And then let's just revert back a little bit to what you were just talking about in terms of famous people that came through Ellis. Oh, yeah. And I know you have some favorites like Sadie Gold. Um, oh, tell, yeah. Well, yeah. Tell, yeah. Can you tell a few of your favorite stories in addition to some celebrities that came through? Yeah, well, this, uh, I, I wrote a list here. Uh, the celebrities who came through were Isaac Bashevis Singer, the writer, Otto Preminger, Bob Hope, uh, former uh, uh, New York City Mayor A. Bean. Um, 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 LaGuardia came through, right? And Sadie Gold, I mean, this poor woman, I mean, how she suffered. How she suffered, I, you know. No, and who was she? Where did she come from? And who who was she? I <laughs> see. I mean, she 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 just was all over, and she she went through concentration camps. She she, I mean, she 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 suffered, and and with all due respect, they, a lot of people suffered. Um, and this is where that intestinal fortitude came in. Um. And I just want to say one thing before I forget. When I was writing the book, and I was in my little apartment on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, mm -hmm. and I remember I'm writing their stories. I'm, yeah. And I felt a pressure in my right ear, a really intense pressure. And it got stronger and stronger. And I, I heard the voices of some of the immigrants who had passed. And it got to a point where I actually had to verbally say, Enough. I've had it. Enough. I'm doing this as fast as I can. I promise you, your story is going to be in the book. I'm telling you, it's going to be in the book. Mm -hmm. And they stopped. They, they quieted down. Mm -hmm. But so, I remember the, the, just the, the, the spirits of, of, of the immigrants who had passed, they were in my, in my, in my face, in my ear. And, you know, they wanted attention you know and i you're gonna get the attention i promise and uh anyway so i just wanted to tell you that story. 14 they were one of the 114 you got yeah, right 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 um but um well and, it's it's a big responsibility to tell the story of of really the the coming of america you know to the pop the general population the changing of our population occurred at the turn of the 20th century from right. all the and immigrants and, and and i wanted to say one another story there's a uh, josephine sorvino page 56 it's a very short story it's a poignant story it's a southern italian story but it's just beautiful and it's one paragraph and you'll cry i mean it, it's just that poignant would, would um would you like to read it um yeah it's it huh would you like to read it yeah it's, yeah i'll read it um, it, it isn't very long 50 no it's a short it's one paragraph I think, I think her voice is still speaking to you okay oh and uh bob hope um his song thanks for the memory comes from ellis island yeah why don't you tell that story that's a beautiful one as well yeah well let me get let me get paula here yeah. uh, uh josephine josephine first and then bob Okay. Um, she was born in southern Italy in the farming village of Tamparne near Calabria. Her first name was changed to Sunday at Ellis Island because she arrived on a Sunday. She has two children, two grandchildren, um, et cetera, et cetera, but she has since passed. Her story is in her, in her own words, I had one brother. He was almost five years old when he came here. <clears throat> At the time, it was just my mother, my brother, <clears throat> and I. My father was already here. 
He came here first in 1921. He had not seen my <clears throat> my brother, his son, until we came here in 1932. <clears throat> I had a great grandmother who lived um, two doors away from us. She and I were constantly together. We used to take walks uh, to her land. Um, she owned beautiful uh, piece of land that was uh, shaped. Um, it had olive trees and it was surrounded by hills and mountains during the evening. She came over to the house and we sat by the fireplace and she told me so many stories, so many fairy tales. I remember well, <clears throat> she told me about uh, Cinderella. She, <laughs> Cinderella. She told me about uh, Moses. Uh, but one thing I do remember um, is when we left Italy, a few days before, she and I took a walk in her land, and she was very, very, very sad. She said, ah, she said, you're going to America. Now, someday you will remember me. But she said, remember, when you get there, when you reach the battery, there is a row of fountains there. But do not drink out of it. Because if you drink from that, the fountain, you're, you're going to forget all about us. Like it had some mystical properties. So when I arrived at the battery, I was looking, final paragraph. So when I arrived at the battery, I was looking for the, for the row of fountains, but I didn't see the row of fountains. So I thought, I guess it must be okay. She also wanted me to write and tell her about the Brooklyn Bridge because she had heard about the Brooklyn Bridge, but she had died before I saw the Brooklyn Bridge. Today, when I'm driving along, many, many times I think of her, the words echo in my memory. You're going to America now. <laughs> Someday you will remember me. Oh. oh, Peter, that's so beautiful. I can hear that her voice is still in your heart for sure. Yeah. What a lovely, lovely story, which, you know, um, brings me to the question that when I was reading the book, I thought there is a theatrical production in this somewhere, or have you ever been approached to do any kind of a, like a musical performance or a spoken yes. word? Because about, it, 20, about 25 years ago, they want, I, I was approached to do a uh, Ellis Island, a Broadway musical. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it got hot for a while. It was some serious conversation about it. Um, didn't transpire, but I'll tell you what did transpire. There's a little high, uh, junior high school in Pulaski, Virginia, right on the West Virginia border. Mm -hmm. And the teacher there contacted my agent about 25 years ago and said, look, we love uh, Mr. Cohen's book. And we'd like our students in, in the class to take the role of uh, one of the immigrants. You know, each student takes an immigrant and we wanna do a play. And um, long story short, they've been doing the play now over 26 years with the same teacher. Oh. And they won the state, one year, they won the state championship in Virginia. And another year they were invited to Edinburgh, Scotland for the international festival. And they won representing the United States. Oh, that's that? fantastic. Oh, what a wonderful testimony to the, your beautiful work. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so let's see, we, we have got another uh, question here. So wonderful to hear and see both of you. Your books were valuable resources for me when writing my book, Alice Angel. So I want to, to shout out a big thank you for your work. There you go. This is from Carol Lamada. Oh. Uh, yes, who is a friend of Save Ellis Island and and his mm. is working on some wonderful works herself about the island. Um, does anybody else have anything uh, else to ask Peter? Or um, certainly, you know, when you look back, Peter, uh, you know, is there anything you would have changed? Uh, you know, I, I think of that when I look at my film and book. And, you know, I think we do our best with what we have at the time right. we're producing these things, right? Um, mm. but it, you know, there are certain things I would do a little differently, or if I'd had more of this or that, do you have any right. of those, you know, those, those 
impulses that, you know, just say, oh, if only I would have, you know. Oh, and then, oh, oh somebody just said, then the Bob Hope story, please, too. Oh, after. the Bob Hope story. Yeah. Uh, no, I went, I went with the energy flow. I, I just went oh. where, where it, it where felt it right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I just wanted to, um, two great, two really, uh, really great stories. Um, and I think I mentioned this to you. There were two women and they were at the Bergen-Belsen uh, concentration camp. Oh, my goodness, yeah. And there was a woman at, at who would take raw metal and put it down a tube into a furnace. <clears throat> the furnace would melt it. And then there was a woman on the receiving end and she would keep the line moving. <clears throat> anyway, long story short, they're now in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It's decades later. Yeah. Th these are two very old women. And the one who put the uh, metal down the tube into the furnace, she was speaking uh, in front of this room of people. And um, and she said, and, and I would send the metal down and, and there would be a woman there on the receiving end and she would push it along. And suddenly a woman stands up and she said, I was that woman who pushed it along. Oh. And they saw each other, the other for the first time in decades since the days of the concentration camp. So that's one story I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. The other story is uh, Isabel Bolarski's story. Her father was a genius, uh, Sidor, and the Cohn brothers did a movie um, um, and uh, used his music uh, in the film. Anyway, Isabel tells a story of being in, uh, um, ironically, Ukraine, and um, Russian soldiers came in, and her father, Sidor, was he was a Yiddish opera singer, and um, he was on the radio. So she was listening to her father on the radio, and she started crying. She passed last year, by the way. He was, she lived the longest of all the immigrants in my book. And she was she was raped by the Russian soldier. And she was describing to me the pain of being raped by anyone, by, by a Russian soldier, while listening to her father's music on the radio. Oh, no. I mean, and, 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 she, and she was in a wheelchair when she said this to me, and she was crying. And she said, Peter, don't put it in the book. I didn't put it in the book. But after, after I pass, you can tell anybody you know you want. So you, so folks, you're the first ones to hear it. <laughs> well, um, certainly, yeah. I mean, like you said, the immigrants came from great challenges, struggles, and yeah. they had enormous resilience to survive yeah. both. Uh, you know, from the country they were leaving on the boat, and then yeah. as the on the rung of the ladder as they arrived in America. So that intrepid spirit gave us a very strong population as a result. Yes, it really you did. Know. And is, yeah, so is ahead, it Isabel? Then I'm going to bug you for the Bob Hope story. <laughs> oh, the Bob Hope story. No, it's just that he he got, he was ready. Thanks for the memory. That's a great right, right, yeah. he, he He was down in lower Manhattan. He had done a show and uh, and uh, he was on the mainland, you know, not on the island, but he was looking at Ellis Island, Statue of Liberty. And he was telling me that um, this is where it all came from. And he got all misty eyed and he came here from England when he was about eight years old. And um, um, and now he, he was so grateful to this country um, that he, he, he was able to achieve what he achieved uh, despite despite all the stuff he went through. And you have to remember, even the famous people, they went through hell too. I mean, they went through terrible times. And, and, and somebody's asking, after your interviews, did you maintain a relationship with any of the immigrants? Oh, yes, for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, hope until he died. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and Isabel, um, when I did book signings in Manhattan uh, and... Uh, through the eastern part of the country because she couldn't travel very yeah. much yeah. i would bring her with me to the book signings and i would say folks you don't need to talk to me if you've got questions talk to isabel isabel take the stage come on up answer the questions you know and and we had like a dog and pony show. i bet she loved it i bet she just loved yeah. it 
Oh, she, she she was special. She she was she was really special. Yeah. And how did if someone else writes? How did the immigrant experience change from the early to the later years? If you could give a little perspective, if you felt like that did change. Well, in the, in the early years, it was um, it, it was everything we think of. It was. It was Mott Street, it was Lower Manhattan, it was the Jewish settlement, it was the Italian section. It, it was all of the cliched images that we know. But in the 1920s, they started the quota system. Right. Um, and then, then it changed, then it changed. And the flows started coming down. So, the, so 1892, uh, Ellis Island opened its doors and then very intense to 1924. Then the quotas came in, and then it slowed down, slowed down, slowed down. By the early 30s, everything was not the same anymore. It was that it was not the same. Yeah, right. the yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, and, and yeah, and then with... Ellis, Ellis Island closed its doors in March 1955. And um, now, yeah. did you? Did you ever meet any of the immigrants you interviewed out on the island? Did you take them back there? Did, did any I what? Did I? Did you take any of the immigrants you interviewed out to the island? Oh yeah, sure, yeah. And well, I would, yeah. What was their reaction when you would take them out? They would cry. They would start crying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was almost as if they became little children again, right? Yeah. Yeah, they, yeah, because when they came here, they they were very young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They would start crying, mm -hmm. and I had to, con you know, I consoled them. Yeah, of course. Now, does anybody have any other things that they would like to ask Peter? Please let me know. I'm happy. We have a few more minutes here before we need to wrap this up. It's been wonderful to hear these stories, Peter. Uh, it's such a Thank gift. You. The book is a wonderful gift to the repository, the portfolio mm. of mm. Ellis Island material, mm. really important contribution. We Here mm. we have, okay, so my grandmother acted the same mm. way when mm. we took her to see her name on the wall, of course. Mm. Well, yeah. Yes, and, yeah. and this, this someone writes that. Um, certainly the wall has become the more modern, um, right. you know, right. shrine to the, right? right? Um, and, um, you know, post COVID, the numbers are back up in the millions of people coming to the island. And right, right, right. I mean, um, close as we have to an American shrine in, you know, in the country. I yeah. Think. Um, yeah. Uh, um, I was going to say, and also there's a train station on the mainland, mm -hmm. uh, not far from Ellis Island. It has about 20 bays in it. And so, when the immigrants would come in, those, let's say, the Irish went to Boston, the Jews went to New York, the Italians, for the most part, went to New York. But the, like the Scandinavians, they got on the train and they were headed to the Midwest, northern mis Midwest. And yeah. so um, and they had orphan trains. They had they had kids who, who lost their parents. They, they didn't have parents, and they, but, but they had to live. They needed jobs. And so they, they were put on these orphan trains and they were sent to the Midwest and they worked in factories uh, in the middle of nowhere in Minnesota and Montana. And and um, and, and so. The background of each immigrant, they tended to form enclaves in areas that were similar to their uh uh, uh to to their the to topography of the land oh, back in Euro europe wherever they came from so so the scandinavians went to colder climates let's say right um, minnesota and and right yeah um but if you go there it's it's very it's very uh touching because um they don't they don't use that anymore it, it's almost a museum now it, it's it's uh now is that on the new jersey side uh it's on, the new, on, on the new jersey side on the mainland yeah is, is it open for uh yeah, yes it, yes yes and I, I would suggest that anybody who wants to go to ellis island also go to goes to that train station yeah, because that's, that's a great idea yeah because the immigrants were put on on those trains and they were sent west 
And so not everybody went to Boston, not, you know, not everybody went to New York. You know? Chicago, right. The big cities. Right. Now we have two more questions. Were efforts made to accept different religious groups within countries? It would seem tricky if everything was based on a country by country basis. Um, religious groups were not, uh, were not a point of contention. Um, a point of contention was criminal, yeah. legal, medical. Did you have glaucoma in your eye, yeah. uh, in your eyes? Um, those were more tangible yes. reasons for re uh, rejection, not religious, no. Could you be a public charge, right? If you oh, Right, they didn't want you to be a public yeah. charge. Yeah. Right. Well, well, this is what the INS soldiers were, uh, not soldiers, uh, 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 wor workers, when they were watching the Chinese, Chinese had a wonderful little system. Um, there was a guy who would give you 20. You had to come through with money. And so 20 bucks got you to America at one point. And so he would give somebody the 20 bucks. You give me two dollars and I'll give you 20. He, he stands in line. He shows the INS agent the 20. He goes through. The guy gets his two bucks. And his twenty dollars back gives it to the next guy, and so he had like this little side business going on. I mean, it's like so Ellis Island had all of these um, things happening simultaneously. Well, nothing, ba right? nothing bad. But... Well, really, the ingenuity of the immigrant had to be pretty high, right? right. Yeah. That's why I say survival of the fittest, right? So we have a few more questions, then we'll wrap it up. Do you think an Ellis Island could ever be built in today's world? No, because the world has gotten too large and because um, it's not a question of one location anymore. Um, you know, you can now with technology, you can come from anywhere. You could live anywhere. You can so it's it's not localized to any building or any island or the world has changed. And um, um so no, no. But we, we do we have these ports of entry, major right. ports of entry, right? Um, and, and it wasn't that just process, uh, that it's that the processing occurs. Um, right. Maybe right. not so much the care and feeding of the immigrants like Ellis um, provided, right? Um, and it wasn't just Ellis. No. They're, they're, they had INS stations in Baltimore, in oh, New Orleans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So here's another one. I believe my husband's grandfather and some of my relatives came through Ellis Island. She asked, can any records be searched online? And we both know the answer is yes. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah of course, yes. That's how, that's how the world <laughs> has changed. Ellis Island Records dot com, dot dot org, something like that. Um, right. But we both doing research on Ellis and the medical and whatever. We used heavily online resources. Right. Right. And even right. more in the 10 years since I did it, 15 years since I did it and you did it before. Right. Much more is digitized. Um, right. so, uh, let's see. Na oh, last one. Name of the train station, Central Railroad of New Jersey. Oh, here we go. Great. Name of the train station is Central Railroad of New Jersey Terminal. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I want to go. Next time I'm out, I want to go there. So yeah. uh, thank you, Peter, for also for Taxi. I am a huge Harry Chapin fan. Laura, you're a lovely host tonight. Thank you. Uh, your book and film truly gave light to forgotten history, such a profound validation of my ancestral, ancestral narrative. Thank you very much for that. And then Brian Scanlon, link for the records. Here it is, heritage.statueofliberty.org. Thank you, Brian. So I think um, if we don't have any more questions, it is almost, it's 7.57. Mm. We should wrap it up here uh, on behalf of everyone at Save Ellis Island. Thank you, Peter, for participating in this wonderful My pleasure. event. My pleasure. Uh, visit visit Save Ellis Island's website 
to find out about upcoming virtual events and special tours on May 4th. Jennifer Arnoldi with Millis plus Schnering LLC will lead the architectural tour. Uh, and on, let's see, uh, choo -choo -choo. and on June 22nd, we have our second nursing program of the year. So save Ellis Island records dot or, or save Ellis Island dot org for details mm -hmm. on these events and more. You'll hope we hope you'll join us for our next author series virtual event on May 14th with Wendy Chin Tanner for a discussion of her book King of the Armadillos. She'll be in conversation with Maria Slimios, uh, author of the Black Angels, the untold story of the nurses who helped cure tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. So visit Save Ellis Island's website to become a member, learn more about the restoration work being done and ways you can donate to help save this national icon mm -hmm. and preserve our history for future generations. Visit uh, Save Ellis Island's website to renew your membership or join as a member and to show our appreciation for a donation of $35 or more. We will send you a Save Ellis Island notebook and a pen set. So thank you. Mm -hmm all of you for joining us it was a pleasure mm. and mm. we will see you all again i hope and peter all the best to you uh I thank you and I, to I, you yeah yeah take care good night all okay good night thank you.